All right, so it's 301. We are going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the eighth program in our Lake Friendly Living Awareness Week. Uh, we are so pleased you could join us today. My name is Jen Tafano and I'm the program associate for the Cuga Lake Watershed Network. I work closely with network board member Ed Currier and his wife Nancy, who you will see here on the network's Lake Friendly Living program. Uh, please note that this event will be recorded and available on the Watershed Network's YouTube channel starting next week. So we invite you to just take some time, enjoy this next hour without feeling the need to take lots of notes. You can refer back at any time. And please visit the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance page to see the remaining presentations available this week. We have one this evening at 7 p.m. on sustainable vineyards, and then our keynote presentation at 1 p.m. tomorrow. And um, the Watershed Alliance link is in the chat for your convenience. You can go there to find out about this program and all the others and to register. Uh, please add any questions to the Q&A box and Camille will address those at the end of the presentation. Um, a little bit about the Lake Friendly Living Program. It provides practical steps that homeowners can take right on their own property to protect water quality. And some of these steps include reducing lawn size, using phosphorus free fertilizer, maintaining septic systems, planting rain gardens, and using native plants. We are pleased. Are we set? Um, hold on. One sec. Hold on one second. We're just going to go this way. <laughs> Step in the other day. We're just going to go like this. Uh, independently, several Finger Lakes associations and watershed organizations launch their own lake-friendly living and lake-friendly lawn care programs. And these lakes include Canandaigua, Cayuga, Cayuca, Atisco, Owasco, Seneca, and Skinny Atlas. And just over a year ago, we all got together and realized the power of uniting our voices and programs toward a common goal. We formed the Lake Friendly Living Coalition of the Finger Lakes to provide educational sessions designed to inform and empower residents to make changes to protect all of the Finger Lakes. And I would like to just thank our sponsors, um, the Nature Conservancy, who sponsored our keynote tomorrow, and the Chautauqua Lake Association that sponsored Doug Tallamy's presentation uh, to kick off our week on Monday. And just one final note, uh, the Lake Friendly Living Coalition has a little pledge drive. We're hoping to garner uh, 500 pledges over the course of this week. So if you're interested in the Lake Friendly Living Program, um, all the lakes have um, information on their websites and all their cute little logos are located here. So please visit the Lake Association closest to you and um, check it out, see if it's for you. And with that, I would like to introduce Nancy Courier, who will introduce our speaker for today. Nancy, go ahead. Okay, our speaker for today, we are so in, in lucky to have her, is Camille Marcotte. She is the Water and Ecology Educator for Cornell Cooperative Extension in Onondaga County, working on the Skinny Atlas Lake Watershed Education Program. Camille has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies with a concentration in Communication, Culture and Writing from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and an MS in Natural Resources from the University of Vermont. She was formerly a Community Environmental Educator with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Dutchess County, New York, where she provided education on stormwater management climate resiliency, land use planning, energy efficiency, waste management, and more to stakeholders throughout the Hudson Valley. She also worked as an education intern at Sloop Clearwater, delivering curriculum focused on the Hudson River and its ecology. Camille is an experienced environmental science communicator and social scientist with a history of working with stakeholders to improve the sustainability of their communities. We are excited to now learn more about how we can improve shorelines as a means of addressing water quality. Welcome, Camille. Great, thank you all so much. Thank you, Nancy, Ed, and Jen for inviting me to present today. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Let me know if you are hopefully seeing my presentation okay. Um, 
Perfect. Okay. So my presentation is landscaping for Cayuga Lake shorelines. Um, I was invited by Nancy, Ed, and Jen to talk a little bit about Cayuga Lake. Um, I mostly work on Skinny Atlas Lake, um, but added a few Cayuga Lake slides to this presentation. And really this is for any of the Finger Lakes. Um, so I'm going to quickly introduce Cornell Cooperative Extension. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, we are part of the nationwide extension system in New York State that's run through Cornell University. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension has a presence in every New York State County. So wherever you live in the Finger Lakes, you have a local Cornell Cooperative Extension office. Um, basically, we take research-based information from Cornell University and other institutions and universities across the country and translate it in a way that's um, helpful for local communities. And every Cooperative Extension office is different. So your lo local office might have different programming. Um, in Onondaga County, we have a bunch of different program areas that we cover from 4-H, agriculture, um, horticulture, which is our master gardener program, and I'll talk about them a little later, uh, nutrition and natural resources. Um, so like I mentioned before, I um, work in the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed normally. Um, my position is funded by the city of Syracuse to help protect the water quality in Skinny Atlas Lake. Um, and I do that through providing uh, workshops, presentations like this one, um, sharing newsletters and updates on lake issues. And uh, recently, within the last year, we've created a website for Skinny Atlas Lake. So if you're in the watershed or just curious and wanna know more about Skinny Atlas Lake, you can visit scanlakeinfo.org and find out more information there. Um, so I wanna start off this presentation pretty broadly by talking about the concept of a watershed. Um, I think a lot of times we think of water and land as completely separate. Um, however, because of this concept of a watershed, um, our land and water are actually very connected. So a watershed is just essentially the area of land where all of the precipitation, whether it's rain or snow, um, snow melts, any surface runoff, uh, groundwater, all of that ends up in uh, one common water body, whether it's a stream, um, one of the finger lakes, or even an ocean. Um, and so, you know, what we do on our land and on our properties has an impact on the water quality um, of Cayuga Lake or Skinny Atlas Lake or whatever your local water body is. And so, you know, I think a lot of times we focus on our differences, but one thing that we all have in common as human beings is that we all live in a watershed. So, um, as I mentioned before, I work in Skinny Atlas Lake watershed, and so I'm by no means an expert on the Cayuga Lake watershed. Um, however, doing research for this presentation, I found um, several facts that I thought would be interesting and relevant to highlight. Um, the first one being that Cayuga Lake is the largest of the Finger Lakes watershed, so it's 800 square mile watershed, which is um, pretty big. Um, so there, that means there is a lot of um, land area that's providing input in, into Cayuga Lake. Um, there are 95 miles of shoreline, so a lot of, of miles of shorelines that could be shorescaped. Um, there, again, there are a lot of water bodies that flow into the lake, more than 140. Um, a lot of municipalities, uh, 49 villages, towns and cities, seven counties and 140,000 people that are having some type of impact on Cayuga Lake. Um, land use is pretty evenly split, about a third agriculture, a third forested and a third um, mixed development. Um, again, more of the population. In the southern part of the watershed in the north is predominantly agriculture. Um, and reading through the different reports that have come out recently, um, it seemed like a lot of the water quality concerns um, came from sedimentation, um, whether it be from stream bank, shoreline erosion, road erosion. Um, and again, because the watershed is so large, um, you might have people who are several miles away from the lake um, and might not think about the impact that they have on Cayuga Lake. Um, and so that can kind of create a little bit of a disconnect sometimes. Um, so ideally, you know, our lakes would have sustainable shorelines. So what does that mean? Um, basically, a sustainable shoreline is a shoreline that's managed in a way that balances um, habitat and the ecosystem benefits of a natural shoreline with, um, you know, that human connection, that sense of place 
um, you know, outdoor recreation, tourism, um, all in a way that is sustainable for, for future generations. Um, so what are Cayuga Lake shorelines like? Well, like most of the Finger Lakes, um, hundreds of years ago, the shorelines were um, forested, which allowed for water to soak into uh, the ground and be filtered on its way to, to the lake. Um, however, um, as humans have started to move in around the Finger Lakes, um, a lot of deforestation and development has happened and that has contributed to um, a lot of erosion problems, you know, of erosion of stream banks and shorelines. Um, to my knowledge, it's a more of a problem in the southern end of Cayuga Lake watershed where there are creeks with very steep slopes that pass through developed areas um, in the Ithaca area. Um, and so eutrophication, so this sedimentation and, and adding of nutrients to lake is something that naturally happens. However, humans have really been speeding that up. Um, so what are some examples of erosion or what might you see? Um, you might see some obvious stream bank or shoreline erosion. You might see undercutting where um, instead of it eroding from the top of the bank, you can see water kind of cutting in underneath that bank. Um, maybe you see large root systems that are exposed or you see trees that are falling into the water. Uh, maybe you just see exposed soil with no vegetation. Uh, maybe especially after a rainfall event, you notice that the water looks very cloudy, kind of chocolate milk brown color. Um, or maybe even you're looking at historic, historical photos of your community or your own personal property and you're noticing um, 30 years ago, the shoreline looked a lot different than it does today. Uh, these are some images from Skinny Atlas Lake. So kind of uh, very obvious erosion. Um, so you can see the exposed soil, lack of vegetation, roots that are exposed, trees that are falling, obviously on these docks and damaging property. So this is basically what you don't wanna see. Um, so what causes shoreline erosion? Uh, a variety of things. There are obviously natural causes, you know, wind, water itself is naturally going to cause erosion, um, ice scour, depending on your shoreline material, you know, gravel, sand, clay, bedrock is going to be a lot harder to erode. Um, and then also human impacts, which I've talked a little bit about, um, but maybe uh, there's hardened structures that are failing, or if they're not failing now, there's the potential for wash out of sediment behind a bulkhead or a wall that um, could eventually cause it to fail. And then that can redirect erosion around to other places along the shoreline. Um, maybe there's been a clearing of any vegetation, removal of topsoil that's contributing to erosion. Uh, urbanization, so our development, so more impervious surfaces, surfaces where water can't soak into the ground and then is contributing more to runoff that can lead to increased erosion. Um, maybe our roadways, our, our ditches aren't managed very well um, and that can lead to, to erosion. Um, timber harvesting itself isn't bad. However, there are certainly um, companies that come in and don't follow best forestry practices and that can definitely contribute to erosion. And then boat wakes. So um, are you in an area where there is a lot of boat traffic and those wakes are contributing to, to wave um, energy and erosion? Um, we also can't ignore climate change's role. So this is data from the period of 1958 to 2012. And um, in the Northeast, you can see that we've experienced a 71% increase in um, very heavy precipitation. So that's two inches of rainfall in a 24 hour period. Um, and with this more heavy precipitation comes um, more potential for runoff, especially as we continue to, to develop the landscape. And that leads to um, more nutrients and, and sediment being washed into our water bodies. Uh, why care about shorelines? Um, they're naturally beautiful areas. Um, you know, there are fish that enjoy the shade that forested shorelines offer and macroinvertebrates, um, birds and all types of creatures that enjoy shorelines. Uh, we as humans enjoy shorelines. We use them to, as areas to launch our boats, to, you know, run and jump into a lake um, for tourism. And the Finger Lakes are a huge 
tourism draw. And so protecting our water bodies can really help with that. Um, they offer, again, a variety of habitat for animals and also ecosystem benefits, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, and it's basically that transition. It's that connection between our aquatic and our terrestrial ecosystems. Um, and as I noted before, some erosion is natural and doesn't need to be fixed. It's really when you're seeing that problematic erosion with trees falling on, on docks and, and exposed soil. Uh, throughout history, we've really had this debate um, between gray infrastructure and green infrastructure. Um, I think in the past, you know, gray infrastructure was really what was winning. It was, um, you know, we were channelizing our streams, really working to kind of control nature and, um, you know, protect our infrastructure. Uh, and I think recently a lot of ecological research and environmental science has really shown the benefits of, you know, living shorelines and more natural um, ways of, of landscaping. And um, so we've kind of transitioned into focusing more on ecological engineering and in these green approaches to, to our shorelines. So some examples of hardened shorelines um, are ha maybe having a retaining wall, like you can see in this picture on the left. Um, on the right, there's cribbing, which is these log wood structures that are like interlocked to create an artificial bank. Uh, you might see gabion baskets, which are wire cages filled with rocks, um, or you might just see riprap, um, large rocks that create kind of a very unnatural looking shoreline when they're just done by themselves. Um, so what is shorescaping versus having a hardened shoreline? What do we mean when we talk about shorescaping? Um, basically landscaping our shorelines using a variety of plants, um, specifically and ideally native plants. Um, so this is an example from the Hudson River, um, that's where I grew up and lived for many years. And I thought this was a really perfect example of what a shoreline you know, could look like in the past and then what it could, could become in the future. So on the left, you see um, the, the example of before where there's a, a wall, there's this little house there. Um, and so this was on a property that was actually really damaged by Superstorm Sandy when they had a huge storm surge on the Hudson River. Um, and it really caused a lot of damage to this building over here and the wall. And so the land trust that owns this preserve was looking for ways to, to avoid that in the future, especially since the Hudson River is going to be facing sea level rise. Um, and so they transitioned to the after photo that you see, which um, you can see they took out this um, wall over here and revegetated where the wall used to be. Um, they still use some rocks in, in place, but um, overall it's much more natural. And instead of having this building over here, they focused on having a pavilion, which would be able to withstand flooding um, from the Hudson River and, and the tides that the Hudson River naturally has. And, you know, they still created access to the river, this little path over here where you could bring your kayak or if you wanted to just wade into the Hudson River uh, a little, you still have access to, to the river. So what are the benefits of shorelines that are landscaped? Um, again, I've talked a lot about erosion control and Having shorelines that are natural, you have plants that are holding, the root systems are holding the soil in place. So that helps with erosion and, and stabilizing our shorelines. Um, again, they can absorb energy from waves or currents or boat wakes. So, you know, a, a bulkhead, a wall, that wave energy is going to hit it and bounce off and, you know, redirect that energy elsewhere and potentially cause problems to neighboring properties or further um, somewhere around the lake. Um, versus a natural shoreline is really able to absorb a lot of that energy and not, you know, dissipate that energy elsewhere. Um, it also can help protect water quality and help with flooding by storing and capturing and, and, and filtering water before it reaches um, a lake. It can also, it just looks beautiful and can help with property values. Um, it can help you with privacy, depending on how you do your design. Um, it can also help prevent property damage. Again, if those shorelines are stabilized, you're not having trees falling onto docks and you know maybe it's 
private property or maybe it's even a public park where there's some type of erosion happening and that can reduce what the public is having to invest um, in, in fixing docks that are being destroyed by trees because the shorelines are, are not stable. Um, again, it increases habitat and biodiversity. So planting a variety of native plant species can really attract a lot of pollinators and beneficial insects and then birds and you know that a, a whole bunch of creatures. Um, obviously outdoor recreation. So if you're attracting birds, I know I personally love birding. And so, um, you know, the more birds that are attracted that leads to increased opportunities for outdoor recreation. And again, tourism, which is a huge draw for the Finger Lakes. Uh, and a lot of times it's very low maintenance and minimal costs, depending on, you know, your specific shoreline and what you, you plan to do. Um, so some things that you'd want to consider, um, it's hard to kind of say like, this is what you should do uh, definitively because everyone's property is, is so different and everyone has different resources. Um, but things that you'd wanna take into consideration are the slope and elevation uh, relative to the water. You wanna look at the geology and hydrology. So um, what is the soil type? How well does it drain? Um, what is the interaction between the surface water and the groundwater? Um, do you have stormwater runoff as an issue on your property? Are there areas where water is pooling that you might need to consider putting in a rain garden in a specific spot or something like that? Um, what type of vegetation exists? So do you have trees, shrubs, plants that you can just leave there and make it make it easier on you? or are there a lot of invasives that you'd probably want to remove um, before you go and, and plant other, other species? What are the environmental conditions like? Um, is there a lot of exposure to wind or waves? Again, looking at um, the boat traffic, is that going to be an issue? Uh, adjacent structures, so what do your neighbors have? Do they have retaining walls? Do they have natural shorelines? How might that influence your property? Um, it's good to kind of do some observation of, of that. And also just, you know, being aware of things like where is your septic system located? You don't wanna be planting um, over your septic system. Uh, obviously, what construction materials will you need and what permits will you need? Um, and then all of these kind of contribute to your, your design plan, which is going to be different again for everybody, um, depending on all of these different things. Um, I always like to advocate for shorelines being one place on your property that you don't have to be super neat about. So, you know, we have enough enough to clean up on our properties. Um, make shorelines one area where you don't really need to be thinking about them too much. Um, you know, don't be mowing all the way to the edge of, of the lake or stream. And I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, if there are logs that have fallen um, and they're not causing any issues, leave them there. They can provide habitat. A lot of um, larger shoreline uh, shorescaping projects will actually incorporate logs as a way to help dissipate some of the wave energy so they can actually be beneficial. Um, and plant a variety of native species and really resist that urge to kind of be super, super neat and tidy. Um, I know it's hard, not everyone's into the super wild look, but um, it, it is beneficial and, and can make it easier on you too. So I wanna dig deeper a little bit um, on lawn care in, in the United States. Um, Americans spend nearly $30 billion each year on lawn care, which is crazy. Um, you know, we're, spend, we're um, using 320 gallons of water a day, about 30% of which is just going towards watering our, our lawns, our gardens. Um, you know, we're using gas powered lawn mowers and other lawn equipment that's contributing to air pollution. Again, so these connections between our land, our water and our air. Um, and I found this statistic from the EPA, which is one hour of mowing the lawn with a gas powered lawn mower produces as much air pollution as 11 new cars being driven for one hour, which I think is a pretty mind blowing statistic. Um, so thinking of all this money and water and you know, all these resources that we're using, um, thinking of ways that we can redirect them towards more natural landscaping. 
Another note that I wanted to make about uh, lawn care for water quality, um, in New York State, there's actually a law that you are not allowed to apply fertilizer containing phosphorus um, unless you have a soil test that shows that you need phosphorus or if you're trying to establish new, new lawn or new turf. Um, this is not for, for agriculture. They have their own separate um, regulations that they have to follow. Um, and additionally, you're not allowed to apply fertilizer with phosphorus within 20 feet of a water body. And between December 1st and April 1st, no fertilizer um, is allowed to be applied. Um, so when you're going to the garden store and you're looking um, for fertilizer, you wanna look for something that has um, a zero in the middle. So that means no phosphorus. So before you build, um, obviously you wanna consider all the different factors I talked about earlier, but you might need different permits depending on how large of a project you're going to do. Um, if you're doing something small on your own private property, um, you might not need any of these, but depending on where you live, your local municipality could have different planning and zoning regulations that um, dictate you need a certain type of permit or approval. Um, if you are disturbing more than one acre, you are subject to um, the state's stormwater regulations. Uh, if you live near a regulated wetland, sometimes there are um, other requirements that you, you need to um, adhere to. And also sometimes the US Army Corps of Engineers, if you're doing a larger project, would get involved. Um, ideally, whoever you hire to do this project, if it's larger, would handle this. Um, but when in doubt, I always encourage people to reach out to their local municipality at the very least to see if there's if there are any regulations you should follow um, or the DEC as well if you're if you're doing a larger project. I also like to put in a plug for working with your neighbors. Um, I know not everyone gets along with their neighbors for many varied and valid reasons. Um, however, I think the difficult thing about shorescaping on private property is that you know you might have a natural shoreline and then next to you there might be 10 miles of hardened shorelines and then another few miles of a natural shoreline and so you know ideally we'd have these really continuous um, miles of, of natural shorelines and so working with your neighbors um, might be cheaper, you know, you're pooling your resources and you can design something that is, is more effective, um, you know, in terms of increasing the impact of, of having a natural shoreline. You know, shoreline erosion is not confined to, to property lines. And so, you know, working with your neighbors can be a great way to create a really effective shoreline. So what do you need to shorescape? Um, if you're doing a basic revegetation, um, you want to get a variety of native plants. Um, I know um, there was already a presentation on native plants that was great. And so um, there's a lot of local resources to find out about different natives. Uh, you might want some stone and boulders, which can be really useful to stabilize the bottom of, of the shoreline. Um, soil and fill, erosion control matting that you can get from local garden centers, um, protection from deer is always great because I know deer are always a problem. Um, and then live and dead stakes if you wanna do some, some staking. Um, so why do we focus so much on encouraging people to have native plants versus just having a lawn at to the edge of their um, lake or, or stream? Uh, basically because turf grass or lawn has a very, very shallow, tiny root system. So you can see these native grasses have much um, deeper, denser root systems. Um, and that's basically why we talk about using natives. In addition to you know, the habitat benefits and pollinator benefits, natives just have much more extensive, deep, dense root systems compared to, you can see on the left, the non-natives, which are definitely better than the turf um, in terms of root system, but again, not the same as natives and don't provide um, the habitat benefits that natives do. So a lot of times people ask me how big should my buffer be? And I always tell them bigger is better. 
Um, but you also have to work with what you have. So if you, you know, ideally a hundred feet would be great, but if you only have five feet, you know, that's better than nothing. So focus on the five feet that you have than, you know, trying to create the biggest buffer. Um, so yeah, you really have to work with, with what you have. Um, and so these are kind of the different zones that you might see in your, your buffer. So um, you have the littoral area and you have this emergent area where plants are kind of, you know, half in the water, half out. And you have your riparian area directly adjacent to the water body. And then you have the upland zone. So I encourage people to kind of let that riparian area just grow, um, you know, grow wild and kind of not be super neat about that area. Um, if you have invasives, you can get rid of those, um, but really just kind of let them grow, grow wild. Um, and then the upland areas where you can kind of start to transition to a little bit more of a manicured look if that's what you're you're interested in um, because that's what you'd kind of be seeing from from your windows if you're looking out them so what makes a good um, shoreline planting really a mixture of a bunch of different ground cover grasses perennials shrubs uh, trees and woody vegetation and aquatic plants um, you don't have to go for all of these if you wanted to kind of start small um, you can see this example of a riparian buffer that we planted next to Skinny Atlas Lake. And I think we just had, I think we planted a couple trees and mostly like shrubs and perennials. So we didn't have all of these, but um, you can kind of mix and match depending on your own site um, characteristics. So there are times where slopes are just too steep and erosion is too extensive for revegetation alone to work. And that's where you can kind of bring in the gray infrastructure and using things that are not natural like rocks and, and riprap and stuff like that. So these are some techniques for homeowners. Um, so obviously we've been talking a lot about revegetation and that's really easy um, for low um, to moderate erosion. Um, live staking is another easy one for homeowners to do themselves. Um, contour waddling is a little bit more involved, but could be done. Um, and then it gets a little bit more complicated, like brush matting and things like that are a little bit, a little bit more involved. Um, erosion control matting is something that you could do as a homeowner. You can always find that um, at a local garden center. So just an example of some of these techniques that are a little bit easier for homeowners. Um, one is live staking. So usually it's willow and dogwood, at least in the Northeast. I know those are the two that I've heard of being used. Um, and essentially you're just placing these live stakes in the ground kind of at an angle so that you're almost creating little triangles. Um, you can see this person is having a really good time doing it, um, but it's, it's pretty simple. All you need is the, the stakes themselves. Contour waddling is a little bit more involved. Um, again, you're using the live stakes. However, you're also preparing these um, waddles, which are sausage-like sausage bundles of, of live stakes um, that you're then trenching and placing in the trench and staking through. So that can be a little bit more involved depending on how large of a site you have. Uh, contractor techniques. Um, this is when you would kind of incorporate some of the uh, gray infrastructure, so riprap or some of the gabion baskets or cribbing. All of these can be vegetated. They don't have to just be gray infrastructure. However, this is usually done more in kind of um, a municipal project or community level project than, than a, a private property um, project. So, um, in terms of revegetation, there's not really much maintenance that needs to be done. Um, really, it's just watching the first two to three years to see how the plants establish themselves and if they're doing well. Um, maybe you find out that you know you planted coneflower in a, in, in a spot and it's not doing well, so you have to swap it out for something else. But um, really, it's just looking at how plants are doing, making sure they're not invasives creeping in. That's obviously always a huge issue. Um, and yeah, just making sure that what you've done on your property isn't contributing to, to erosion elsewhere. Um, you can see on the right, this is an example of a vegetated gabion. So the baskets are underneath and they put this erosion control matting on top and then they've placed vegetation 
to grow um, in between the, the rocks. So I want to talk about social science because that is my background. And I think it's really interesting to, to read some of the studies that have come out about um, what the social science says about different shoreline choices and why people choose what they do. Um, so this was a study from 2015 in Mobile Bay, um, Alabama. So I think it was a survey of about a thousand homeowners. And basically the study found that there were a lot of misperceptions about the different impacts and cost effectiveness of, of shoreline type. And that these misperceptions led to um, the promotion of armoring or hardened shorelines. So um, they asked homeowners, you know, do you alter your shorelines and when do you alter your shorelines? And um, homeowners reported that they really only changed their shoreline type when they faced damage, usually caused by hardened shorelines on their neighbor's property. Um, but homeowners were concerned about environmental impacts and they really did like the look, the aesthetic of a natural shore, a shoreline. Um, the top three um, attributes that um, people considered were effectiveness, cost, and durability. That's what people really cared about when they were considering their shoreline choice. Um, and again, leading to the, these like misperceptions, residents thought that vertical walls and riprap preventment, so more armored shorelines were more effective, more durable, and um, had less maintenance. Um, than natural shorelines. They thought that natural shorelines um, needed more maintenance. So they also, in this study, they asked homeowners um, what um, factors led to them choosing their current shoreline type. And so they found that the biggest predictor was what their neighbor's current shoreline was like. So if they're if that homeowner, their neighbor had a vertical wall, that homeowner, um, the probability that that homeowner also had a vertical wall was over 90%. However, for homeowners whose neighbors did not have a vertical wall, so maybe they had a natural shoreline, the probability of that homeowner having a natural shoreline was more than 60% and having a vertical wall was only 19%. So they asked about, you know, what's your current shoreline type, but they also asked, what about your preference for shoreline type if you were to change your, your shoreline in the future? And um, this again showed that the neighboring shoreline condition was the biggest um, predictor for um, homeowners' preference for shoreline type. So homeowners, um, if their neighbor had a vertical wall, the probability of them also preferring a vertical wall was 75%. However, for homeowners who were not neighbored by a vertical wall, the probability that they would choose a wall was only 36%. Um, so this leads to some key themes that I really wanted to highlight in this presentation. Um, one is that stakeholder engagement is really great for preserving and restoring natural shorelines. You know, if the shoreline is already forested and vegetated, keep it that way. And it's good to engage with, with homeowners, with municipalities, to let them know that, you know, you should leave your shoreline in that condition. Um, however, if it needs restoration, um, you know, getting out the word about that is, is great. However, um, I think a lot of times we focus on lack of education or information. And as a study found, um, lack of information is not the only reason why homeowners don't have natural shorelines. There are all these other things that come into play. So individual attitudes and social norms play a huge role in influencing um, all of our environmental decisions, um, including shoreline type. And, and that's been found in a lot of environmental psychology research, um, showing that our, our attitudes, our values and norms really do play a, a big role. I wanna highlight some resources. Um, so Cornell Cooperative Extension, we are obviously a resource. If you are interested in shorescaping, we can help you with soil testing. Um, we don't do it ourselves, but we outsource it. And um, you can call your local Cooperative Extension and find out more about that. 
Um, we also have our master gardener volunteers. They are really, really great and very knowledgeable about all things gardening and can absolutely provide excellent advice about different plant selections um, and where to source your plant from, plants from if you're interested. Uh, Cornell has a woody plants database that I find really helpful um, for searching for woody plants if you want to incorporate those into your shorescaping. Um, there's plenty of native plant databases. There are so many resources out there, especially recently. Um, I like the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. I think that one has a lot of extensive information. Um, and Audubon is always great as well if you're looking to attract different bird species. Um, I want to give a plug to Hudson River Sustainable Shorelines. Um, they have a lot of really great resources on how to shorescape. Some of them are relevant to the Hudson River, but most of them are, are information that are applicable to, to any water body. And I found a lot of great um, information from them. They also periodically do webinars. It used to be every other month, but I think with COVID, it's kind of been more infrequent. Um, but you could also attend some of their educational sessions. And I think they've recorded a lot of the webinars too. So that can be really helpful. Um, in Cayuga Lake locally, there are a lot of resources and I relied on um, the Watershed Network, the Intermunicipal Organization and Environmental Action Now to help me do research on Cayuga Lake for this presentation. And then Finger Lakes Land Trust does a lot of work throughout the Finger Lakes and around many of the lakes um, protecting land. Um, so if you're interested in having a conservation easement on your property or something like that, you can also reach out to Finger Lakes Land Trust. Um, in terms of funding, it's very difficult for um, homeowners to get funding for um, shorescaping. A lot of the funding is more for the municipal level. Um, however, the buffer in a bag program is really great through the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, so any resident who has at least 50 feet along a water body you can usually get two bags of native plants and shrubs. And then Trees for Tributaries also offers um, free trees and, and, and shrubs for um, riparian plantings. Um, that's usually more for the community level. Um, the DEC also has their Water Quality Improvement Program, which has been pretty regularly funded. Um, that's more for municipalities. Um, same with Climate Smart Communities Program. Um, the New York State Green Innovation Grant Program is through the Environmental Facilities Corporation, and they have a lot of funding for green infrastructure, um, including riparian plantings as well. Um, and then I always encourage people to reach out to their local counties. There might be programs and initiatives at your local county level, um, and especially soil and water conservation districts. Um, I work a lot with Onondaga Soil and Water Conservation District in the Skinny Atlas Lake Watershed, and they do amazing work, including um, a lot of work with farmers. And so um, your soil and water conservation district might have programs or technical expertise that they can, can offer you. So they are a great resource. Um, and I'll actually share uh, a resource with you all at the end of this um, in just a second. So I want to thank you all for tuning in. Um, this is my contact information. Um, I'm not sure how the follow-up is going to go, but um, Jen and Nancy and Ed can feel free to share my, my email and my phone number if you all have questions. I am more than happy to, to, to chat with you or to email with you. So yeah, thank you all. And I will take any questions that you have. Great, thanks so much, Camille. Um, thank you, Camille had a few questions come in while you were talking. Um, Ed and Nancy, do you want to take a look at the chat and I'll do the Q&A? Okay. Um, you can maybe just kind of tag team to make sure we catch everything. Um, hey, on, on, on the chat is, a, is an age old question about natural lawns and neighborhoods in general. Neighbors want lawns that look really perfect. And if you have one that is not perfect looking, it's not very well received. So there's some lawn pressure in that case. And it, it would certainly benefit that neighbors would work together to accept a natural look that's better for all of us and how it would help to improve water quality 
rather than trying to stick to the model of beautiful, uh, uniform, one grass community. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a huge, um, a huge thing. The stigma of having a perfect lawn is definitely, you know, a, a huge issue. And I think one of the great things about education and where I think it can play a really powerful role um, in the environmental field is is people who are going to be early adopters. You know, there are people who already have natural shorelines. Nancy and Ed <laughs> are one example. And so, you know, these early adopters can kind of influence um, through social norms when people see what the the property looks like and and how how well it's working for you to have a natural shoreline. Um, you know, I think that can kind of help contribute to to changing our norms and and but it's it's hard to change norms and and culture and and the stigma and and yeah it you know I think we do we do still have this picture of um, you know just lawn being kind of the ideal but um, I think continuing to educate and and share information about the benefits of having a variety of of, of native species and, and different plants so that you're not having this monoculture that's um, you know not really attracting a lot of of pollinators and and beneficial insects and and birds that that we want to have, you know, and, and need to have in, in our environment. So yeah, it, it's definitely tricky to break people out of that mindset. Right. So yeah. those of us who have ecosystem type lawns need to stick with it and explain to folks about, eh, it may not look like your lawn, but it's very important to look at it in terms of an, eco an ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the questions that came into the Q&A, Camille, was um, you made a comment early on that phosphorus was allowed when new lawns were putty, being put in. And can you explain why that um, why that's OK? Um, basically, just making sure that um, the lawn is able to establish and it has all the nutrients that it needs, including phosphorus. Um, you know, phosphorus is is a nutrient that sometimes is needed, but oftentimes is is just an excess. And so, um, you know, with a new lawn or there are cases where people have needed phosphorus um, and, and a soil test has shown that, but that's why soil testing is so important because then you can see what, what nutrients you do need and, and maybe you don't need any phosphorus and then you can not apply the, the phosphorus fertilizer. But um, yeah, that's why I always encourage people to, to get a soil test and to test periodically just to see um, how your soil is doing and, and what nutrients it has. That's great, thank you. Um, another question that came in, you talked just briefly about this uh, just a moment ago, but the uh, question is, will soil and water help with construction and costs of some of these projects? I think that means soil, local soil and water conservation districts probably. Yeah, so, um, it really depends. Um, I know in the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed, we have the watershed ag program through our soil and water, and they do help farmers with the, the costs of different um, best management practices, including some of these um, types of um, restoration, but um, it really depends on your local office. And so um, I'll share a resource that Ed helped put together and that I added to that has all of the the websites for your local soil and water in, in the Cayuga Lake watershed um, where you can reach out. Um, I know some, I believe in the southern tier, there's a soil and water that has done some riparian plantings with, with private property and they've helped cover the cost. But um, to my knowledge, most of the time soil and water um, does not help cover the cost, but it, it really depends. Um, they might be able to at least provide you with some technical expertise or, or resources in that way, even if they can't cover the cost of, of, of plants and things like that. Very good. Um, question from Frank. Um, Frank's curious um, if you've seen much success with the integration of using cellular confinement systems slash geocells or as a hybridized strategy for hard and soft scaping. And maybe for those who aren't familiar, you could explain what some of those terms are that Frank used. Can you see those in the Q&A? 
Um, oh, and the Q and A. Um, I'm not as familiar with that. <laughs> so sorry, Frank, I don't know as much about that. Um, yeah, I would have to get back to you with more information on that. Um, that's, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to add um, in the chat, uh, Marjorie added that Cortland County and Onondaga Soil and Water assisted uh, Tully Lake with shorescaping. So we know that's that. That's great. Okay, let's see what else. Ed, what else do you, are you seeing in the chat there? Uh, from Bill, hello, Bill. Um, about purple loosestrife has been great for holding soil at the north end of Cayuga Lake. Uh, our cottage is at the north end of Cayuga Lake and we did have uh, purple loosestrife, but I believe it, uh, it can really spread quickly. Um, so as we have planted other uh, materials along our shoreline, the purple loosestrife has kind of settled down and has, has not been taking over as much, but it, it does spread. And yeah, it, so purple loosestrife is, is an invasive. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously invasive plants, like their root systems are holding the soil in place, but um, just the fact that they are invasive, they're out competing our natives. Um, you know, if you can switch switch purple loose stripe out for, for native plants, that is, is more beneficial. But um, I mean, true, you know, non-natives do hold, hold on to the soil and, and so do invasives. I did see another question about eco lawns and I believe we could refer uh, that person to Frank Rossi. Is that true? The lawn expert from Cornell? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Frank Rossi is amazing and he talks all about how to still have a lawn but make it environmentally friendly. Great, and we have a very interesting question, Camille. Um, Marion asks, is it worth putting a garden behind an existing wall? She says, many of us already have walls along the water and thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think sometimes depending on the resources that you have, it's expensive to kind of remove an entire wall or, you know, it can be a lot and then, you know, you are still dis disturbing the shoreline to do that. So yeah, putting a garden behind an existing wall can be a great way to help prevent erosion from um, occurring behind that wall and then causing it to fall in the, and fail in the future. So yeah, that's an absolutely a great idea to, to help stabilize the shoreline. And, and that way you're still allowing water um, that's running off over the landscape to be, to be captured and filtered in that garden before great. it reaches the lake. So yeah, that's a great option too. It also helps to kind of soften the look instead of a stark wall, you've got some beautiful vegetation along the edge. Right, absolutely, it definitely looks very beautiful. Um, there was an early question, Camille, about boat wakes, um, talking about boat wakes being a problem, obviously contributing to the, the degradation there. Is there ever, um, ever attempts to limit close to shore boating? that you're aware of, you could speak to? I'm not aware of any specific legislation, but I'm sure there have been places that have, you know, I mean, I know sometimes there are like reduced speeds in certain areas and things like that. Um, I think it's hard to tell people like, you know, you can't have your, your boat here. Um, so I think it would have to be a really, really extreme case um, where they would just completely not have boat traffic, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's not necessarily the worst thing, but just something to consider if you are in an area where there's a lot of boat traffic, how might that influence your, your property and your shoreline design? Because you don't want to be putting all these resources into designing something that, that, you know, might, might fail or might not be the most effective. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, so here's a question from Mora. Mora says for residential area where people want access to shoreline for swimming and other things, what is the best way to control invasives or even native species that crowd the access area? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
I think, yeah, I mean, obviously people want access to, to shorelines and, you know, for, to use for boating. So you can always include access as part of, of your design. Um, I mean, I think controlling invasives is, is very difficult. Um, a lot of the times, you know, hand pulling is, is kind of the most environmentally friendly method. Um, you know, obviously there are always um, chemicals that you can use, but um, especially close to water body, I obviously don't recommend that. Um, and, and native species, again, you can, there's always, you know, hand pulling and, and removing by hand. Um, you know, it, it really depends on how big the area is, but I, I think, you know, just having a small, incorporating a small path and, and small access area to, to the lake as part of your shoreline design can, can pretty easily be done. And, and that's a great way if you have a patch of invasives to kind of remove all of those and have that be your, your area where you're accessing uh, the lake or, or water body. Okay. And another question just came in. Are there any recommended practices for shorelines that are being built up, for example, by shale, as opposed to being eroded? Um, I'm not really sure. I haven't really focused much on shorelines that are being built up as, as a problem. Um, I've mostly focused on erosion, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. That's, that's an interesting question. It's something I'd have to, to look into more for sure. So Next this would be a shoreline where the shale is being washed ashore and built up along, along the bare spaces of the shore, right? Which is hard, of course, to hold that together. Huh? Right. Yeah, I think it would depend too on, on what is exactly is happening. Um, <laughs> David, who answered, he said yes. Yes, David, who asked that question. Um, any other questions? Anything else? Now is the time to add them here, either via the chat or the Q&A. Oh, let me share the file with everyone. Let me see if this works. I haven't shared through Zoom yet, but I want to share the resources so that you all have access to that. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can share the file. Um, but you can keep going if there are any questions. Sorry, we have a little break right now. We don't have any additional questions that have come in. If we missed any uh, that any anyone has asked, please. Uh, there was a comment uh, from Bill Hecht about the um, boat wakes. Um, he's saying, I have 950 feet of natural shoreline here on Cayuga, and it is a major corridor for wildlife. There are state speed and noise laws mm -hmm. in some bigger lakes. And I see we have information about the biological control of releasing insects to control the uh, increase in purple loosestrife as well from Bill. Good. Oh yeah, nice. I know um, there's also been releases of insects to control hemlock woolly adelgid happening in Skinny Atlas. So yeah, there's a lot of research on biocontrol of, of um, invasive species happening, which is great. That's another way <laughs> to control invasive species for whoever asked that question. Okay, so I just shared um, the resources that um, Ed put together and that I added to with some of the funding sources, things like buffer in a bag, trees for tribs, um, and just some of the plant databases too. So you should all be able to see that in the chat, maybe. I don't know if I can share it with everyone. It's here. Yep, I can see it here. If anyone has any difficulty opening it. This is my first time sharing <laughs> through Zoom, so. Yeah, it came through, Camille. I've got it. 
Perfect. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, and then I guess that's a question that I have for you, Jen, is how are, how is follow-up going? Are you going to share um, the recording and um, all these resources? I can share my PowerPoint too, if people want to see that. So what's going to happen is all of the downloaded recordings are being uh, collected and they're going to be available in a couple places. One is going to be on the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance website. They're gonna create a new space for us to hold all of the recordings. They will also be available on the Cuba Lake Watershed Networks page. And I think maybe Canandaigua Lake as well on our own individual YouTube pages. So what will happen is everyone who registered is going to receive a link to that YouTube site once it's active and every, we know everything's up there and working properly. And we also are hoping to have a, a resource file there as well that can include everything from um, individual slide decks that some folks have requested of the presenters, any of these additional files, um, links, anything that people may look for. Um, we're so grateful to the Regional Watershed Alliance for hosting all of this. Um, and if you, know, you ever can't remember about the Regional Watershed Alliance, you can reach out to your local watershed association, your local lake association, and they will point you in the right direction. Um, but that really, they are going to be the home of all of this information for quite a while. And so please look there. And like I said, we will notify you when all of it's up and ready to go. So don't feel like you've missed anything or you need to search around for it. Um, it will be probably sometime next week that these will be available. Great. That's awesome. I love that everything's going to be in one place. Yes, exactly. That's this, why this coalition is, is working so well. Um, we did have one, one final question, if you have a second, Camille. Yeah. Um, this comes from Adam, and he's asking, what is the, your favorite thing that you've seen homeowners doing to assist with improving landscaping on the shorelines of Cayuga Lake? That's a great question. So I don't normally work in Cayuga. So if I have to answer for Cayuga, I would have to say, um, Nancy and Ed, I I didn't even know that I came across, um, you know, their their property when I was looking on um, Facebook to pull images of Cayuga Lake, and um, I sent them my presentation, and they said, "Oh, that's our property." And so, um, you know, I think spreading the word of 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 homeowners who've already done um, this type of landscaping is is really important and. Um, again, really helps with um, some of the stigma of, of needing to have a perfect lawn. And um, I also think the lake friendly living care or lake friendly land care pledge is a great initiative and one that's happening um, to my knowledge and on all of Finger Lakes. Um, and so like Jen mentioned earlier, they're looking to get more pledges. And I think, you know, that's something that a lot of homeowners have already signed on to, but the more that, that we can get to sign on to, I think is, is a great, great effort for in terms of landscaping. So I have to put in a plug for that too. I just wanted to add an answer to Adam's question. We have uh, 65 feet of shoreline that's mostly gravel, gravel and sand. Every spring we would use the wheelbarrow to redistribute the eroded gravel and sand. And uh, as I got older or we got older, uh, no. One time we were kayaking in the um, Montezuma area and came across some seed pods of the rose mallow. And we sprouted those seeds the next year, planted them along the shoreline, and they have done a wonderful job of holding that gravel in place. And we have other na natives that have found their way there. We didn't plant them, but because we started to create a buffer with that, that other uh, items like uh, wild cucumber and uh, a variety joe, joe pie, pie joe pie weed have begun to populate the area and um, it, it has turned out very well and uh, has saved my back from uh, moving gravel every mm -hmm. spring yeah that's the other thing is if you know if you start planting natives and and, and creating this habitat other natives will pop up just from you know being spread by by birds and, and sure. other pollinators. So yeah. So we have a comment here. Um, I maybe you could provide a resource here, uh, Camille. So we have a, a comment that just came in 
Uh, someone said, I have a textbook steam, stream bank erosion and would like professional help with it. Um, and who, uh, mm. you know, what kind of, where would someone with that type of a question, where, where's a great place for them to start? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think depending on where you live, you could reach out to your soil and water conservation district. Um, you could also reach out to us at Cornell Cooperative Extension. We can share, um, you know, more extensive resources on shorescaping. Um, actually, the Lake Champlain Basin area has a really great one on shorescaping next to, to a lake. So, um, yeah. Oh, actually, I'm seeing this comment right now they're in skinny atlas so i can definitely follow up with you Lindsay, um since you're in my watershed and um give you some resources that's great okay well we're just after four o'clock just after the hour um if anyone wanted to throw one quick last minute question in here feel free we'll give it just a couple seconds if anybody wants to to ask anything last minute of Camille. And um, again, we will send out all of her contact information. Camille, thanks for providing that. We'll send it to everyone after the program. And I think I think we are set for, for this one. Great. Yep. All right. Thank you, Camille. Yes, you inspire yeah. us to do more. Thank you. I try. <laughs> yep, exactly. Thank you so much, Camille. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming today. Bye, Jen. Thank Bye. you, everyone who Bye. attended. Bye-bye.